Hello, and welcome to the third annual mistake session, formally titled A Failure Shared is Not a Failure, Learning from Our Mistakes. My name is Rebecca Gridley, and I am joined today by my dear co-organizers, Kari Rayner and Tony Siegel. Full disclosure, due to technical difficulties, both my introduction and our first presentation have been re-recorded, and the remainder of the session has been edited. Kari, Tony, and I, along with our presenters, are speaking to you from across the US and even from the UK. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I am standing is the territory of the Mohican, Golden Hill Paugusset, and Wappinger peoples. I would like to thank them for their strength and resilience in stewarding this land and its waterways through the generations. For me, one bright spot in these very strange times has been the opportunity to explore these local landscapes with my family. Kari, Tony, and I are very excited to be going virtual with the Mistakes session today and to bring this event to the wider AIC membership. This is our third year organizing the session, and I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce how it came to be. In 2017, inspired in part by an article by Michelle Marincola and Sarah Maisie, Kari organized a webinar for ECPN on the subject of preventing and learning from mistakes as an emerging conservation professional. Tony was one of the speakers, sharing a few of his own mishaps from over the years. However, as we all know, lifelong learning is an integral part of our profession, and mistakes aren't just made by those who are new to the field. So with the momentum from the webinar, we wanted to provide a broad venue where we could share and discuss our mistakes on a regular basis and normalize this discussion. Thus was born the mistake session, introduced ahead of the 2018 Houston meeting in an article um, in AIC News. These sessions have had a confessional, cathar cathartic, and collegial tone with both humorous and emotional presentations by brave colleagues who have shared treatment errors, managerial mishaps, and those disastrous accidents that we shudder to hear about, all with the goal of helping the rest of us to avoid repeating them. We found that a cash bar was a key ingredient to success in our, in our inaugural, inaugural session. So, while we are tuning in from different time zones today, I'd like to point out that it's Friday and it is five o'clock somewhere. So I invite you to raise a glass to your colleagues and to your own mistakes as we move through the session. Several of our speakers will be sharing cocktail recipes. I am drinking a Chinar Negroni, a twist on my favorite cocktail. Chinar is a bittersweet artichoke liqueur and is used as a substitute for tr traditional Campari. In this spirit, pun intended, we have abandoned traditional speaker introductions and instead asked our presenters to share some fun facts about themselves, along with a recommendation to help you pass the time days of social distancing. I'll start us off. In my short-lived ballet career, I danced in the Nutcracker at Lincoln Center for two years as a child. My recent favorite read is also New York-centric. Rules of Civility by Amor Towles, whose other novel, A Gentleman in Moscow, is also excellent and particularly relevant these days as the main character is under house arrest. My co-organizer, Kari Rayner, has recently gotten more ambitious with her baking. Favorite treats that she's made so far include cinnamon date sticky buns and Meyer lemon bars. She's also rediscovered a love of mystery novels and especially recommends a crime series by Tana French set in Dublin. Tony Siegel recommends reading Georgette Heyer's Regency Romances by Candlelight and enjoys taking long romantic walks in the basement. In between giving Zoom talks, he and his wife, Jennifer, spend time in the yard communing with the birds on the feeder and laughing at the squirrels. And now onto our program. Our speakers will be discussing unfortunate accidents and errors in judgment, as well as more systemic issues that result in mistakes. Kari will moderate our Q&A session at the end, and then we will have time for further discussion where we will welcome your comments, reflections, and ideas. If you're suddenly feeling inspired to share your own mistake, just let us know and we'll call on you at the end during the discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Lauren Fair. Lauren reports that she's been getting through quarantine by indulging in true crime podcasts and shows and like many, has harnessed her mask sewing skills. Lauren, take it away. Hello, everyone. 
I am thrilled to be kicking off this fun event, which at its heart is about openness and sharing. And I'm happy to be sharing my story with you today. I'm speaking to you from my home in what is today called Westchester, Pennsylvania, the original homelands of the Lenni Lenape people. The Lenape are also the original stewards of the land upon which Winterthur Museum, Garden, and Library resides, the setting of the events that I'll be sharing. So without further ado, let's talk about mistakes. Uh, I don't know this for certain, but I would guess that every mistake we make has a root cause within ourselves. Only when we can identify this cause, examine it, call it out, can we then learn from it. Otherwise, we'll be bound to repeat it. The tale I will tell today has its root cause, I believe, in efficiency, or rather trying to be too efficient. I'm sure we all know what it's like to feel pulled in many directions by a variety of demands. As an objects conservator whose time is spent often chaotically between working in a museum lab and teaching in a graduate conservation program, Task switching is an ever-frequent reality, often occurring a dozen times in one day. As conservators, the reality is our treatment time at the bench represents a smaller and smaller percentage of our daily work lives. Switching in and out of treatment tasks can take a not insignificant amount of mental acuity, especially when switching into a, a treatment task that something from something very different, say answering emails or coming out of a committee meeting on gallery lighting. This can and should take time as well as awareness for when we are truly ready to take on treatment. So the root cause of my mistake I'll tell you about is my not having done this, not taking the time. And my story, title of my story is therefore called literally the worst thing you could do to a syringe. So here's the ceramic before Lauren. I'll tell you more about what this object is in a moment, but for now, know that it's a salt place stoneware lidded jug in the shape of an owl, and the lid comprises the owl's head. And here is the lid after Lauren. That's right, I knocked it off the table surface onto the floor. So, we know the root cause of how this happened, but what are the physical logistics? So play by play. This ceramic is part of a 20, a group of 20 plus ceramics that were chosen for a show at Winter Tour in 2017 called Treasures on Trial, the art and science of detecting fakes. Here you can see them on display and our poor little owl jug is in the right hand case, second from the left on the top shelf. All fixed up, of course. To give you a better sense, uh, here's a closer look at some of the ceramics in this, yes, quite quirky group. They are all jugs, figurines, or candlesticks, and you can, and yeah, uh, they're all fakes. Meant to imitate 18th century Staffordshire wares, these ceramics were used in a 1992 trial in London of a man accused of having knowingly sold modern made pots as 18th century antiques. Much of the trial focused on determining the authenticity of these pieces. The collector of these ceramics, Henry Weldon, decided to keep them even after all evidence proved them modern forgeries so as to keep them off the market. And in 1998, he donated them to Winterthur. But let's go back to the scene of my crime. I think you can see in this picture part of the problem. Mainly, these ceramics were incredibly dusty and needed light surface cleaning. I decided, for the sake of efficiency, to line them all up on one table and carefully rotate them around, brushing with soft brushes and holding my Nilfisk micro attachment to vacuum them. I did this with a spare half hour I happened to have in the course of my day. In hindsight, of course, it was an accident waiting to happen. Too much happening on one table surface, a brush in one hand, a vacuum attachment in the other. 
I don't even really recall how the lid got knocked, but I think we can all imagine it. I was trying to be too efficient. They only needed light surface cleaning and it would be a quick treatment of the roof. And the other thing that I have to wonder was, was I also thinking subconsciously, these are only fakes. I of course hope that this is not true, but it could be. Would I have been so eager to be efficient if these were not known fakes? Because I'm a conservator, I can make it look like this lid was never broken. But because I'm a conservator, I have a unique opportunity to intensely intervene into the life of an object. I'm a human being with my own potential for bias, my own potential for stress, anxiety, overwork, and carelessness, and my own potential to do literally the worst thing you could do to a ceramic. So what have I learned from this mistake? Well, for one, I learned that I have a very understanding curator. When I told her what I did, her words to me were, we all make mistakes, and I know you feel more badly about this than I do. That has stuck with me, and it made me feel safe to be open and honest, not just with her and my institution, but also with myself. I also realized that my training prepared me really well for what to do when a mistake like this happens. It provided me with a framework in which I could act logically despite my many emotions that were flying all over the place when hearing the crash. Mainly though, what has been reinforced for me is the supreme importance of taking the essential time to properly prepare both physically and mentally for any treatment task, no matter how much time that task is projected to take and no matter how, mi how minor it may seem. As a wise owl once said, or in this case, a Brazilian lyricist and author, why is patience so important? Because it makes us pay attention. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge the people on this screen. Thank you so much. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Lorraine Finch. Lorraine says she is a brilliant tap dancer. She works as a supporting artist in films and television and will give a prize to anyone who can find her in Fantastic Beasts. She recommends people watch the Ealing comedies. Her favorite is Passport to Pimlico, and her special skill is that she can wiggle her ears. Lorraine, would you like to take over, please? Thank you very much, Kari. I appreciate that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about when studio furniture and equipment goes rogue, or for the Calvin and Hobbes fans amongst you, attack of the deranged mutant killer monster studio equipment and furniture. So my first example comes from my work at the National Army Museum and the removal of heat set tissue from a letter written by Florence Nightingale when she was at the Crimea. Heat set tissue is a, heat, uh, is a tissue that's coated, coated with a heat activated adhesive. And it was used in paper conservation for lining and repair. In theory, heat set tissue is reversible with heat but as it ages, it cross-links and you need to use solvents. So going for the less invasive treatment first, I went to the cupboard and got out the spatula and the thermostatic control for the heated spatula. Allowed, plugged it in, switched it on, allowed it to warm up and started working. I noticed a very strange brown patch starting to appear on Florence Nightingale's letter and at the same time, a very warm and burning hand. As I looked down at my hand, I could see the molten plastic from the handle of the spatula running down my hand. Thinking that really the last thing I wanted to do was drop molten plastic all over the surface of Florence Nightingale's letter, I moved my hand out of the way as far as I could and dropped the spatula onto the studio table, which then promptly melted. So at this point, I'm thinking, I don't want to drop molten plastic that is still on my hand onto Florence Nightingale's letter. The studio table is melting. 
I need to switch off the heated spatula, um, but you know, clearly it's faulty and am I going to get an electric shock from it? And the absolutely worst thing, conservator burns down museum. So the spatula and the thermostatic control had both been PAT tested, which is the portable appliance test, which is mandatory in the UK. However, the portable appliance test only tests electrical equipment for electrical safety. That is, if the wiring is okay, what it doesn't do is test whether the thermostatic control is still functioning. And I can only assume that this is what the problem was. It was the thermostat that had become faulty. The result of this was a burnt hand, a permanent melt of the studio table and a permanent scorch mark on Florence Nightingale's letter. My second example comes from my work as a freelance accredited conservator. I was working on a life assurance policy from Walter Scott and I was doing a backing removal. I was waiting for the backing to soften and so whilst I was waiting for that, I went over to a set of shelves to check something in a file. Checked the file, put the file back on the shelves, turned around to look at something in the filing cabinet, at which point my lizard brain kicked in and was quite aware of something moving beside me. I went immediately into the hunch protective mode as the um, studio, as the shelves, um, decided to fall over, depositing all of their contents on me and um, all over the table where the object was sitting. So whilst I was being showered with uh, books and lever arch files and whatever other contents were on the shelves, and I was hurt, I was more concerned about the object. However, when I trained at Camberwell College of Arts, they did run into the importance of um, good studio practice. And so I had covered all of Walter Scott's life assurance policy with blotters, apart from the space that I was working on. So with shaking hands, I went over to the life assurance policy, picked off the lever arch files, the books and everything else that had rained down from the shelves. The blotters were dented, they were abraded, they had discoloration on them from the, the colours on the books. And if anybody, you know, lever arch files have got lovely metal bindings all the way around them. So there's some really nice significant dents in the blotter. However, the life assurance policy only had a couple of dents in it, which I was able to take out. So the result of this was well, a cup of tea and a sit down with a biscuit because I was so shaken up. But after that, the shells were screwed to the wall. So they're not going anywhere anymore. And I have since moved studios and I still use those shelves and they again are screwed to the walls. I'm now in a bigger studio so I make sure that there's nothing over the surface of my workbench. So there's nothing that can fall down onto my object when I'm working. When I was talking about this to another conservator, a photographic conservator, they shared with me a similar experience. So they have a washing sink in which they wash their photographs. Over the top of this, they had a drying rack, the sort of thing you'd find in laboratories with pegs that you put your beakers and so forth on and your other glassware on. They were washing a photograph. It always happens when you're treating something. And at this point, the drying rack decided to part company with the wall that it was screwed onto, depositing yes, you can glassware over the surface of the photograph. The result of that was that the conservator has now moved the drying rack to a completely different part of the studio where if it falls off, it's not going to be an issue. They've also removed the shelves. And as a result of that conservator sharing that story with me, I now make sure that when I'm doing a wash, there is nothing over my object on any shelves that could possibly fall off. And in that vein, I hope that what I've shared with you over these few minutes have been useful to you in some way. And if anybody wants to contact me, I will put my email address in the chat and also my Instagram and Twitter handles. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Nyla Bird. And uh, in her spare time, Nyla loves elaborately painting her nails, recently picked up crocheting during the quarantine, but is still a beginner, um, and is a tiny bird enthusiast. She recommends the National Treasure movies as a way to laugh and rant at the same time. Welcome, Nyla.
Thank you, Tony. I'm just going to share my screen. All right, can everyone see the presentation? Okay. Cool. So I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that I am presenting from the traditional land of the Lenape people, also known as Wilmington, Delaware. I want to thank the Lenape people for their ongoing caretaking of this land, as well as the river of human beings, also known as the Delaware River. So today I'm going to be talking about two examples of how objects situated in the wrong context can lead to their misinterpretation. I understand that these past sessions have been centered around admitting one's own mistakes, as some of the presenters did before me, so I want to be clear in saying that these mistakes are not my own. The art of Erasure is an article that has been floating around in the online conservation community. So forgive me if I'm about to present on something you already know of. In order to not misrepresent any context surrounding the mistake I'm going to get into, the information I'm presenting about this painting is simply an abridged version of the full article. I have removed the conservator's name and pronouns for this presentation because the goal is not a public shaming of one person, but to recognize an example of a problem that can affect us all. The restoration work on this painting was done in 1988 by a local conservator. The conservator's job was only to bring out the artist's original style and content, and content which had diminished naturally with time. However, the conservator would correct something more than the ravages of time. By the time the conservation was finished, they quote, corrected the character of the woman portrayed. Created in 1873 by New Orleans-based artist Francois Fleischbein, the painting portrays a woman of color who had been rumored to be Marie Laveau, the so-called voodoo queen of New Orleans. However, in 1976, the Times-Picayune published an article by a local art critic who boldly asserted that the woman of color portrayed was the artist's slave, Betsy. These speculations were based on primary preliminary sketches of the portrait. However, this identification proved baseless and unlikely. What is more, there is no proof that the artist ever participated in the institution of slavery. Unfortunately, when the Historic New Orleans Collection, or HNOC, purchased the painting in 1985, the incorrect conjecture informed their perception of the work, which they consequently mistitled Betsy. However, the painting tells a different story. The portrait presents a young woman conservatively dressed in a shapeless black ensemble. She chooses elegant adornments made of silver, diamonds, and pearls, a bold yellow head wrap complemented by a voluminous lace rough collar fastened with a yellow bow. All her expensive accessories, access to lace in particular, was often limited to the white elite of the Atlantic world. The portrait makes apparent the sitter's beauty, wealth, and status, proclaiming her agency in the antebellum world. Obviously not an enslaved woman, she is also not Marie Laveau. While Laveau may have been spiritually powerful and financially stable, she was not a member of the New Orleans elite and would not have been dressed in such finery. Why then have so many people repeated these absurd assertions about the sitter in the portrait? To start with, New Orleans loves Marie Laveau. Everyone wants a piece of her, especially art collectors. Consequently, just about every single antebellum portrait of a woman of color has been identified as Marie Laveau at one point or another. The reality of life in New Orleans for a free woman of color was much more complex. Free women of color entered into legitimate domestic partnerships with black, white, and interracial men alike. Though interracial marriage was illegal, white male partners could and did legitimize their relationship through paternity acknowledgments on baptismal records and by recognizing their interracial wives in their wills. Outside of marriage, women of color in antebellum New Orleans possessed a degree of autonomy unheard of throughout the rest of the United States. 
When Louisiana became a state in 1812, people of color owned half of the property in the French Quarter and women of color owned 70% of that property. There are cases of plantations owned and run by free women and men of African descent. Free women of color were given an oppressive amount of agency in New Orleans, which they often used to resist racism, sexism, and the institution of slavery itself. When looking at this portrait, it's not hard to imagine the sitter amongst these fascinating women. However, the reality of her status has been hard for some to stomach due to the perpetuation of tropes and stereotypes of slavery. To imagine an interracial family as the head of a plantation would complicate our perceptions of the past. Perhaps this is why, when confronted by the painting in the late 80s, the conservator took it upon themselves to overpaint the entire canvas and in the process erase the sitter's lavish lace collar and yellow bow. They also altered the background color of the portrait from a cool gray to an eerie green brown. They overpainted the ruffles on her right sleeve and the details on her chair. They altered the contours of the sitter's hand, face, and head wrap. And finally, when releasing the work of a free woman of color back to the historic New Orleans collection, the conservator seemingly settled the debate and noted the painting as a portrait of Marie Laveau. The HNOC was dismayed when they finally got the painting back from treatment. The restoration work was a work of fiction in the same line as the reductive narrative surrounding Marie Laveau. This, distre this is distressing, but hardly surprising. African-American history is full of lies and omissions. So is women's history and Southern history and American history and world history. If we permit these lies to be perpetuated, we skirt our responsibilities to our history and to ourselves. So the takeaway from that is that misconceptions and stereotypes about the history of Black people in America can lead to treatment mistakes and misidentifications, which contribute to an erasure of the nuanced Black experience throughout American history. And I will post the link to the full article in the chat when the presentation is over. Um, moving on to my second example, during my first year as a conservation graduate student, one of my fellow classmates wrote a report on a Peruvian object that was incorrectly labeled as a feathered fan. Through consultation with a curator and textile conservator from Peru, the labeling was corrected to feathered plume. The plume is likely a part of a headdress as seen in the photo on the left. The plume also is constructed differently than the Peruvian circular feather fan on the right. I hope it is apparent that a fan functions differently than a feathered plume worn in a headdress. The miscontextualization of the plume, if not corrected, would have been taken all the way to the display case. Labeling an object as a fan misrepresents the context of the object and lets us perceive the object and its use incorrectly. Since correcting the mistake, the object can be treated and displayed for what it is and not what Western culture initially perceived it to be. So the takeaway from that is just to recognize the pervasiveness of Western culture and how that can our, affect our perceptions of objects. And given this, it's important to question the labeling that an object has been given. In the questioning process, seek out a second opinion from a different perspective whenever possible. And for those of us raised in Western culture who typically engage in Western objects, a second opinion is especially important when it comes to objects from non-white and or non-Western peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nyla, for that really illuminating presentation. I hope that this will provide great content for a discussion at the end and um, questions. So I encourage people to type into the chat box if you have something you'd like to say, and we will call on you in the Q&A. Now, our next speaker is Suzanne Davis. Suzanne is an archeological conservator at the University of Michigan. Since she's not in the field this summer due to COVID-19, she's been focusing on hobbies which include teaching herself how to shuck oysters, stabbing herself with oyster knives, eating cheese, drinking gin, gaining weight, and developing back problems. Suzanne, if you could please take the virtual mic. I'm gonna um, share my screen now. Let's see, here we go. Um, Hopefully that is working for you guys. And you can hear me okay. I can't actually see you right now because of how my own interface is working. So if it, it is not working well for you, hopefully a moderator will tell me. So thank you 
so much for having me. I am speaking to you from the kitchen of my home in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's on the traditional lands of the people of the three fires, the Ojibwa or Chippewa, the Odawa and the Badawadni. And in acknowledgement and celebration of these Anishinaabek cultures, I wanted to start by giving a shout out tonight to the Zibuwing Cultural Center of the Saginaw Chippewa. The center's mission is to recognize, perpetuate, communicate, and support the culture, diversity, and spirit of the Saginaw Chippewa and other Great Lakes Anishinaabek. So this is a really wonderful place to visit in person if you can. It's um, in the middle of what's now the state of Michigan. But even though it's temporarily closed due to COVID, you can have a look at their information and exhibitions online. And um, it occurs to me now that maybe I should put this URL in the chat, which I can do after my talk here. Okay, so tonight I'm going to be sharing a story that involves multiple mistakes I made during an incident of sexual harassment at an archaeological excavation. So if this is a sensitive topic for you, I, um, you know, you might choose to opt out of the next eight minutes. You can just um, mute your computer speakers. But it's not an especially disturbing story, and I think it'll probably be okay for most people. So I'm going to illustrate it using emoji, and I will be assisted in the retelling of this by a dry gin martini. So to begin, we have to rewind several years. And you can just pretend we're traveling back in time as I switch the slide here. So when this happened, I was part of a team of about 10 people. There were six men, and I'm showing them on the left with big smiles. And there were four women on the team, and I'm showing them on the right with slightly smaller smiles. We were working on a relatively remote site where we lived together in a large house, and we worked really far apart from each other during the day, but we liked to hang out at night. We knew each other really well, and in general, everything was good. And then one day, a visitor came, and he's represented here by an eyeball for reasons that will become apparent. So he was a well-respected professional. He was a friend and colleague of two of my male coworkers. He was not part of our excavation team, but he stayed with us for two weeks, during which time he was supposedly doing his own research. So on the first full day of his visit, early in the morning, while I was working in my bedroom before anybody else was up, I noticed him outside, he was standing outside my windows and he was looking in at me. And I thought this seemed weird, but I thought maybe there was an innocent explanation. And I just kind of pretended that I didn't see him. And after a while, he went away. Okay, so on day two of his visit, there he was again. And this time I called out to him and I asked if I could help him in some way, and he said no. So on day three, he's back again. And this time I asked him, why he is staring at my windows and he says, and I quote, I like to look at pretty ladies. Okay, so here I think I should tell you that this man was not from the United States and I did wonder, like, is this culturally okay where he's from? But then I thought that was probably pretty unlikely because it seems like it's probably not okay behavior from like most places. Um, and I just told him I didn't like it, and I asked him to stop, like, hanging around outside my room and staring in, but he didn't stop, even though I asked him repeatedly over the course of several days. So then I had to decide what to do. If I said something to the project director or to this guy's friends, you know, who were, who were my friends, I thought it would cause, like, a big volcanic fuss. But I, and I also wasn't sure, like, despite all of the fuss that I thought would happen, I wasn't sure it would be treated seriously. And I didn't have a roommate. And during the day, I was working really far apart from other people. And I was a little bit worried that if I reported this behavior, I could be targeted by this man who was a lot bigger and stronger than I was. So there, there was kind of like a fear component there. And I did feel always quite nervous around him. Like, the behavior felt predatory to me. On the other hand, if I didn't say anything, he was going to leave in about seven days anyway um, at this point. And then I thought everything would just go back to normal and it would all be fine. Sunshine and rainbows. So that's what I did. I didn't say anything. 
And he kept hanging around outside my room every morning before anybody else was awake. And I just tried to pretend that he wasn't there. And I tried to avoid him as much as possible. I tried to not be alone with him in other parts, you know, of the day. But I never asked myself, what's happening with the other women on this project? Like, I just assumed that I was the only person having problems. And I just waited for this guy to leave, which he eventually did. And then everything was fine. Except that it wasn't. So now fast forward to the almost present day. And last year, just this past fall, I was asked to review a grant for a colleague before my colleague submitted it to the sponsor. And my colleague had written this man into the grant proposal and um, was pairing him on projects with female graduate students. And so now I felt like I had to speak up, but I thought that nobody would take me seriously. Like I just wasn't sure that they would. I didn't really know what to do. And so I finally, you know, years after the fact, I talked to the other women from the dig. And it turns out that this man had behaved badly with all of them too. So he followed them around while they were working. He stared at them. He said inappropriate things to them. He asked them to perform really highly personal services for them. And of course, this was always happening out of sight because we didn't work in direct sight lines with each other. So like me, they, they tried really hard to avoid being alone with him, but it was kind of impossible at this site. Like me, they never reported what was happening. They never talked to anybody about it. And although he had created a bad work environment for all of us, we all wanted to avoid causing trouble. But if we had been willing to speak up, we could have helped each other out a lot. And maybe we could have impacted his behavior. And at least we could probably have kept him from being offered additional opportunities that might make other women vulnerable. So here's what I learned. It's better to speak up because others may be suffering too. We were all really worried about causing problems, especially for the project director. Um, but when we reported this officially, which we did last year, it actually worked out okay. And most importantly, we learned that we need to make better plans for situations like this because field projects are really quite different than most other workplace situations. They bring together people who have totally different cultural norms, you know, from all around the world. The participants are more vulnerable because sites are often remote and everybody is cohabiting. You're all living together. So here's some recommendations to deal with these things. If your institution has a sexual harassment, um, you know, training thing that you can do, like a video or something, everybody on the project should take it. If you, um, if you can, you should also really have a site-specific orientation that covers things like what unacceptable behavior is, because people may have really different ideas about that. You want to make sure people know how to report problems and to whom. And you want to be clear about what the consequences will be uh, and have a plan for carrying those out if you need to. And then you can give examples and talk through how they might be handled just to make sure that everybody is understanding. It's helpful to check in with people regularly about how things are going, especially if you're in a supervisory position, because that gives people an opportunity to tell you, you know, one on one if something is not going well. And then the last point, number four, it may not be that obvious, but it's really important actually. I learned after all of this that most serious sexual harassment and assaults that occur on field projects are perpetrated by visitors. So people who are not on the staff, they're not part of the regular research team. Instead, they're people who are just passing through. So you can easily eliminate this risk by just not letting these visitors stay with you. The living quarters should be only for the research team who've had the appropriate training as described in numbers one and two. And uh, that's it. So thank you for your attention. I hope you can learn from my mistakes. And um, I'm just gonna say here's to all of you. And I will now figure out how to stop sharing my screen here and go back on mute. Well, thank you, Suzanne. I'm not going to wait till the comment section to tell you that um, that's really horribly um, offensive behavior and really glad you shared that with us. 
Um, and uh, okay, I would like to introduce uh, Debbie Orman. Debbie is going to share two mistakes with us, collectively titled Surface and Tension. Debbie is in a band. She plays the ukulele and also loves to dance, particularly Bollywood style. So welcome, Debbie. Thank you, Tony. Um, also, thank you to Kari and Rebecca for having this session. I think it's a, it's a really valuable um, part of, of the conference and uh, appreciate that you're letting us share our mistakes with you. I also like to second Tony on uh, saying how courageous um, you've been, Susanna, to share that story with us. And um, thank you very much for bringing it again to our attention. I think sometimes it's easy to, um, when momentum of incidents happen, um, they dissipate somewhat. So it's really, I appreciate that you brought that back up to all our attention. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share this um, gin, homemade, it's not gin, it's ginger ale, homemade ginger ale my husband made. Um, it's in honor of the uh, Tongva Gabrielino tribe, um, specifically in Atwater Village, Atwater Village in Los Angeles. Uh, the recipe is very straightforward. It's basically ginger and agave syrup. And I'd be happy to share the uh, method of how to make it. It's truly delicious. Um, so to you all. I don't have um, any PowerPoint to share with you. It's just going to be me um, feeling quite vulnerable. But uh, these are two incidents that happened to me when I was um, working in Amsterdam in a private studio. And the first mistake entitled Surface had to do with the strip lining of a very large canvas um, wall painting was uh, green in color with a decorated painted border. And um, in the studio, we had enough space to move all the furniture back in order to strip line this painting um, face down uh, on the floor. So we took the uh, protective measures. We placed numerous layers of protective um, paper on the surface of the floor and silicone release paper. We painted, we laid the painting face down. And um, this was my first ever uh, strip lining. Um, we proceeded to apply Beaver 371 or Beaver gel um, in the gel form onto the edges of this large canvas, um, onto the reverse of the canvas. And thereafter we applied polyester sailcloth material um, to use as the additional strips for, for the strip lining. And we placed these down onto the edges and we heated up the, um, the irons to about 60 to 70 degrees centigrade, which I think is about 150 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and proceeded to uh, go ahead with the strip lining, which entailed applying heat and pressure um, under with a, a silicone release paper in between the iron hitting the um, reverse of the poly ester sailcloth material. And we then placed, uh, once the adhesive had melted, we then placed a, a cold heavy um, metal iron on it, sort of heat seal the adhesive. And we did this systematically. There was four of us working on each of the edges and we did this systematically as we were going around the canvas. Checking, lifting up the canvas to see if the surface was okay and um, everything seemed to be going pretty smoothly until we came in the next day. And we turned the painting around and we saw that all along the edges of this um, wall painting, uh, were tiny blisters, which had indicated to us that we had applied far too much heat onto the surface and rather baffled us because um, 
we all felt that we were working at um, a consistent, I think we didn't go higher than 75 or 80 degrees centigrade to try and melt the adhesive. And so we were quite perplexed as to how this actually happened. Um, so after much discussion, we um, decided to look at the surface that we were working on. And we did some tests with the heat um, onto, uh, through some protective coating onto the surface of the linoleum, which uh, we found out later was actually applied directly on top of a concrete um, floor. So one of our thinking is that the concrete and the linoleum in combination had actually retained the heat. So as we were moving on to the next, feeling quite comfortable about you know, having checked the surface and putting it back down, that actually there was still heat retained in the surface. And I wanted to share this with you because it's something that I think we do take for granted. It's, it's quite like light. Um, it's a really important tool, our surfaces on which we work. And, um, but if it's, if it's not investigated or it's not um, sort of taken into consideration as part of the treatment, some damaging things can happen. And unfortunately, when you, when you blister paint, there's very little you can do. Uh, they were slightly scorched. There was some possibility to lay down some of the blisters, but it really taught us the, um, the importance of surface. And it's something that I've never really forgotten. So when Kari asked me, do I have any mistake? That's the first thing that came to my mind. Um, something that we can take for granted, but should always be aware of and, and not take for granted because done as it is part of, of, of the tools that we use when we're treating objects. The second um, mistake I'd like to share with you was also um, when I was in Amsterdam in the studio and I was asked to remove surface dirt from an oil painting from the mid-century, mid, probably 1950s. We think it was a Dutch portrait, um, a portrait done by a Dutch artist. And um, it was quite colorful, but it had a very thick surface grime layer on top. Um, so having gone through my training, I thought, oh, this should be relatively straightforward. Um, it's oil painting, uh, surface dirt removal. Um, I did a small little test um, on the side and felt pretty confident that saliva was gonna do it. So rolled my swab and quite confidently went in and did another little test on the area of the face. Um, slightly larger than the test that I did on the, uh, on the edge. And I was really taken aback by the, the difference in, in color. The shift was, was really quite shocking. And I immediately thought, oh God, there's a, something on this that I've removed that I shouldn't have removed. And I really sort of whipped myself up into a frenzy thinking, I've, I've really removed something here that I, I, I probably shouldn't have removed and what am I going to do? So. I thought, okay, go out for a walk, stop, go out for a walk. So I did, I walked along the lovely canals and I kind of thought, okay, how am I going to approach my supervisor about this? And walked back into the studio and I saw that my colleagues and the predominantly German working in a Dutch studio were all sort of huddled around a table and they were sort of discussing something. And of course my level of paranoia was particularly high at this moment and I thought, They've seen the painting, they've seen what I've done, uh, they're furious about it. Um, and I, I, I was getting more and more paranoid and, and shaky and thinking this, this is it. Um, there was a lot of nodding of heads and gasping. Um, and I thought, God, this must be really serious. Whatever I've done must be really serious. So um, I thought, well, I'll go back out again. And I sat on the side of the canal and I thought, I sort of prepared myself to be told that I had done um, irreparable damage to this painting and that they, they were going to end my contract and that was going to be the end of my career. And I'm not joking you, it had, it had come to that level at that stage. Um, I then went back in, had a quick look, and I saw that they were still huddled around the table. And this time they were, they were, they were, um, they were a little bit more emotive. Um, there was lots of, <gasps> and, oh my, and oh my God. So I then quickly went back out and waited for my supervisor. Eventually she sort of came out 
um, I had given her the nod to say that I wanted to talk to her and she kind of hushed me away. So I thought, oh, sort of, uh, built up on, I'm trying to build a picture here of what was going through my mind. And I'll just take a sip of my ginger ale as I keep going. Mm. And she came out to me and I sort of had tears in my eyes and I just said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry what I've done. And she was like, well, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, I, I've removed something on the face. It's just this huge white blob on the, on the side, on the cheek of this portrait. And I'm really sorry. I, I think I've removed something that's original. And she then started to cry, which proceedingly then made me feel even worse. And she hugged me. And I didn't quite understand what she was doing. And she said, do you know what we were listening to in the studio? And I said, N no, I didn't speak German. I didn't speak Dutch. Um, I immediately thought they were talking about me. And um, she turned to me and she said, um, do you know what's happened in New York? And I was like, I, d I don't know what you're talking about. The sun was coming down, um, it was beginning to set in um, Amsterdam, and she said, um, something terrible has happened. And the date was um, the 9th of September, 2001. Uh, sorry, the 9th, the 11th of September, 2001. And I, I still wasn't kind of capturing the whole enormity of it until I went back into the studio and everyone was explaining to me what had happened. And there was that moment where I have to admit, there was a slight moment when she said, what are you talking about? Have you not heard what's going on in New York? That there was that slight moment of relief where I was like, okay, they were talking about me, this is okay. Um, followed by a kind of like what 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 have I been doing? What have I been thinking? I've been so absorbed in myself and and this issue, and when in fact something much larger had happened at the same time, and it's it's something that has really stuck with me, and and it's something that I really try um, to get across with colleagues and interns and volunteers that we work with that there is. In this profession, it can be all-encompassing and it can um, completely take over any sort of rational thought, but to keep it all in perspective. Um, and I think that applies to not only horrendous terrorist attack taking place, but as Susanna mentioned, you know, forms of abuse, uh, racist behavior, um, that it's, it's important to, to keep in mind the bigger picture. My sister has always um, sent me this cartoon and it's of a little fly that lands on the moon. And when the cartoon goes from one smaller picture to a bigger, bigger and bigger picture until you see this tiny, tiny little flea on top of a bald man's head. And her words are always saying, keep it in perspective, Debbie. And that's just something I'd like to share. I wanted to share with you all. And um, thank you for your time and, and for listening. Thank you, Debbie, for sharing that uh, unbelievable story. Your storytelling skills are amazing. You had me on the edge of my seat. It's quite emotional. Um, so we're gonna have to move to the next speaker, which is um, uh, Fiona Graham. Uh, Fiona's current address is her 29th. She went to nine different schools on three continents. Uh, she likes to swim, ride, and dance, and she's also a readaholic. She's inspired by humanitarians such as American Paul Farmer, whose excellent biography, Mountains Beyond Mountains, was wit written by Tracy Kidder. Uh, Fiona, if you'd like to share your screen, uh, we await your presentation. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Right. Okay, there we go. Um, hopefully somebody will tell me if uh, you can't see this properly <laughs> uh, or if you can't hear me. Um, 
Right. Hi, everybody. And thank you for having me. Um, and thank you very, very much to Debbie and to Suzanne and to all the other speakers um, today for sharing their stories. Um, I'm speaking to you from lovely Kingston, Ontario, Canada, uh, which explains the spelling of mold in this talk. So um, I also want to tell you, here we go, uh, that I'm grateful to live and work on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, I've been working in this field for a long time, um, 32 years in fact, and I've made my share of mistakes. Uh, this is the story of the most recent one, at least the, the one that I know of. There are probably many more. <clears throat> I, work in <laughs> I work in private practice in Canada, primarily in the area of preventive conservation. And in May 2019, I received a call from a museum for whom I'd done a storage plan the previous year. To protect the far from innocent, this museum shall remain nameless. It's what I would call a mid-size organization with about 20 full-time staff. The caller told me that two interns working in the museum storage room had discovered mold on some artifacts. Environmental consultants were doing testing, but they wanted me to advise them on mold remediation measures for the collection. I submitted a proposal to do an assessment of the situation and to provide them with a plan for dealing with the moldy artifacts. Okay. Um, of course, I also immediately told them to get dehumidifiers into the room and to get the uh, RH down to below 60%. I told them that there had been no mold on any of the artifacts in storage when I was there the previous year, um, meaning that the mold growth had occurred since then. Because I knew that the RH rose regularly above 75 and up to 85% in the storage room, I had recommended in the previous year's report that they install dehumidifiers. I'd cited the significant risk of mold, specifically. Sure enough, uh, when I got their charts, their, the data showed that RH had ranged from 60 to 85% in the month of August 2018, <clears throat> with 13 days of RH over 75%. They had not taken my advice and installed dehumidifiers, and now they had a problem. In order to give them an idea of how much it would cost to deal with the mold problem, I needed to look at the art, all of the artifacts in storage. Um, what could be cleaned by museum technicians under the supervision of a conservator, and what would have to go to specialist conservators for treatment, and how many boxes would need to be replaced. I knew exactly how many shelving units there were and the approximate number of artifacts per shelf. I knew how overcrowded the room was and how little room there would be to work. I came up with a time estimate for the assessment and I submitted my proposal and it was accepted. Okay, did I, you hear me mention boxes? Well, like most museum storage areas, there were lots of boxes. I had looked into some of them during the storage planning exercise and I had assumed, always a very dangerous word, that they were all packed according to professional museum standards. Some were, the ones I had looked at, um, they were, had been actually, it turned out, repacked by museum program interns. But the rest, um, here's where I wish I had horror, mu uh, horror movie sound effects to play for you. Um, I've spent a lot of time in small museums, um, volunteer run. Uh, I have never seen such disregard for artifacts. Um, textiles were crammed into boxes, uh, delicate archaeological points were thrown into boxes with heavy stone artifacts on top, um, dozens of delicate fans were crushed under the weight of heavy objects with disintegrating bars of soap thrown in for good measure. There were hazardous materials left, right and center thrown in with no warning labels on the boxes. It literally drove me to tears. And with most boxes stuffed to the gills with at least four times more artifacts than I expected, my time estimate was completely off. Plus there was the fact that I needed to give them a list of all of the collection care problems I had come across in order to highlight the extreme need for improving their standard of practice. 
that meant my writing my report took longer than expected. And I ended up spending a lot of time discussing um, human resource issues with the director. So I think I made at least three mistakes here. The first was not to underline in conversation and in writing, but especially in conversation, just how critical um, the RH situation was, how great the risk of mold would be if they did not install dehumidifiers immediately, um, how much damage could be done and how much it would cost to deal with. Perhaps I could have persuaded them to install dehumidifiers and prevent a major mold outbreak. Second, I really should have looked inside more boxes, um, but I honestly could not have foreseen this le level of negligence based on my experience. Uh, the result was that my fee, which was based on spending five days doing on-site assessment, was inadequate, um, quite inadequate, for the 15 days it actually took me to look at every artifact. Um, obviously, this impacted all the other contracts I had going last summer, and um, also my sanity because this was not a fun job. Finally, uh, because I forgot to add a contingency to my bid, um, I could have been out of pocket for a lot of money, um, 10 days of fees plus expenses. I did manage to negotiate an extra few thousand dollars from the client, but I ended up at least 5,000 Canadians short. So, my lessons learned. Um, what did I learn from this miserable experience? Well, at my first conservation job in 1990, there was a fire at the museum and um, I became somewhat of an expert in soot removal from collections as well as a vocal advocate for sprinklers in museums. After this experience, I am now as terrified of mold as I am of fire and I will devote an equivalent amount of energy to advocating for dehumidification. Um, of course, I've always known it was necessary to avoid damp conditions, but there's nothing like firsthand experience of disasters to make you completely paranoid. So uh, then, of course, I will look inside boxes. Never again will I assume that um, they are packed properly. I mean, I'm going to, I will continue to assume that museum workers I'm dealing with are professionals who know what they're doing, but I'm going to follow that up with checking the boxes the drawers and the cabinets. Um, I'm also going to not forget anymore to add contingency fees to proposals. This is something for the newbies out there. Um, I also learned that um, I can work in full PPE if I have to, but it is not fun. Mold is gross and I never want to have to deal with it on a large scale again. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope this is a tiny bit useful. Thank you so much, Fiona. Great talk. All right, we're moving on to our next speaker, Ariel O'Connor. Ariel grew up in Houston, Texas, in a family with show dogs, Afghan, hand, Afghan hounds and Italian greyhounds, and knows the real people they're imitating in the movie Best in Show. She has been a modern and ballet dancer since age three, a connoisseur of banana flavored candy, a lifelong hater of cilantro, and in 2003 was almost arrested in Siberia trying to buy malachite from the Ural Mountains. Ariel, please take it away. True story. So this evening I am drinking a Negroni. Excuse me, you were drinking a Negroni. I almost made a Negroni. I am drinking an aviation. I switched pinch hitter. Uh, creme de violette, it's delicious. And I'm speaking to you, hold on, sip. I'm speaking to you from my neighborhood near the National Cathedral in Washington, DC. So my apartment is visible through the two towers in the distance. And this area is the traditional territory of the Nicochank and the Piscataway peoples. And I gratefully acknowledge them and all the vibrant native communities who make their home in what is now called the District of Columbia. I'd also like to acknowledge the labor of people who were enslaved in constructing the historic buildings in our city, including here in the White House and the US Capitol. And in particular for this group of conservators, I want to acknowledge the craftsman, Philip Reed. 
Philip Reed was an enslaved man who was instrumental in casting this bronze statue of Andrew Jackson outside the White House in 1853. And because of his knowledge and skill, this was the first large outdoor sculpture ever cast in America. Sorry. Sorry I was muted. Sorry I'm late. Sorry to bother you. Sorry for this last minute inquiry. Apologies for the short notice. Apologies for this brief response. Apologies for cross posting. I just wanna mention something. I'm just sending you a friendly reminder. Sorry the slide doesn't have any images. Sorry these images are hard to see. Sorry I missed your text. Sorry I was muted. <sighs> these are hard to hear, right? These are hard to say in a row. But these are all phrases that I have said and I have emailed and I have heard colleagues say over the past six years that I've worked at the Smithsonian. I work here at the Lunder Conservation Center at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And one of my favorite parts of my job is that we have a really robust internship program. We have interns and fellows, we have pre-program and graduate and post-grad. And I first started noticing the over-apology use with our pretty early pre-program interns who apologized for everything they asked for and everything that they needed to do their job with. And I had to declare the objects lab an apology free zone. But in hearing it in others, I started to hear it all the time in me. I searched my Gmail for the word apologies. Sorry, yeah, 745 emails came up. I searched my work outlook for the word apologies and sorry. 3,747 emails came up. Some of these are duplicates because it searches through responses, but even so, this is an insane number. It still bothered me in the pre-COVID before times. I would hear it in meetings from, in, in emails and from colleagues. I'd hear it in myself. I started to hear it in myself. I didn't at first. And I downloaded this plugin. They have it on, on Gmail. It's called the Just Not Sorry plugin. And it will highlight when you use the words just or sorry, and it will actually tell you why it's undermining your message in the email. But now in the COVID online world, I hear apologies more than ever. My friends and colleagues are working out of their closets, actually working out of their closets. They're taking care of children and parents and grandparents and pets. And we have back-to-back -back Zoom meetings and our technology never works and our dishes never ever go away. And everyone apologizes for all of those things. And I'm here in the mistake sessions because I do it too. And the more I hear it in other people, the more I recognize it in myself. And I became really curious about the research into over apologizing. And I wanna share a few of the things that I've read recently with all of you. If you think that you hear people who identify as female saying, I'm sorry, more than people who identify as male, you're right. Women apologize more than men do, according to studies such as this 2010 article in Psychological Science. It's not that men are reluctant to admit wrongdoing, the study shows, which is interesting. Research found that men apologize less frequently than women because they have a higher threshold for what they find as offensive behavior. A reminder that in the last FAIC survey, 2014, 77.4% of our field identifies as female. I'm not surprised then to hear that all of these apologies are coming all the time in our field. I want to acknowledge there are cultural differences around apologizing. And my Canadian and Taiwanese and Japanese colleagues have shared with me their different ways to use apologies. I went to grad school in Buffalo. I had Canadian professors and friends and I heard sorry a lot. And I love the CBC quote about Canadian politeness and apologies because every Canadian knows deep down that half the time we apologize, we're apologizing for the incompetence of the other person. It's a true story. In Taiwan, my Taiwanese friends told me that it's about the greater whole instead of the individual. In this article in BBC, quote, the Western notion of sorry is far too limited. Bhaiyusa can also be a feeling, a sensation, a code of conduct, and a whole system of thought that permeates through Taiwanese culture. My Japanese friends have told me they have at least 20 ways to apologize in Japanese. I think this is amazing. And only 10% of a word like sumimasen is an apology. 90% is used to show respect and politeness and honesty. And I think these are all beautiful ways to use apologies. And I want to acknowledge that in my assessment of apologies, I'm really talking about American culture and my experience in the American workplace. 
why do we say sorry? Before you say it, what are you saying it for? Here's a common uh, group of reasons uh, that people, especially who people, people who identify as female might say for the word sorry, might be reasons for saying sorry. To demonstrate compassion and empathy. A lot of people use sorry as a shorthand for sympathy. It's wonderful to have this kind of compassion, but often you don't need to apologize for things that you can't control. How often do you hear people say things like, I'm so sorry you were late because of the New York City traffic. Could you say, how frustrating that you were late because of the New York City traffic. To fill the air. Sorry is used as a filler word, the same way that um and like uh, and, and those kind of filler words are used. It can happen when we're nervous, but it loses its meaning absolutely entirely when used this way. So try being okay with silence in this case. To interrupt. Many people, many girls are raised to be very polite and that translates to the work environment as well. And depending on your particular organizational culture or your work environment, Interrupting with an apology can actually lower your status, especially when other people don't do the same. So pay attention to how your coworkers do this and if they interrupt with apologies and who does and who doesn't. To keep the peace, you might wanna be warm and nurturing and agreeable and we often use sorry to maintain the social harmony, to reset a conversation maybe after an argument or an uncomfortable moment. And sometimes this is warranted but sometimes if it's not, sorry can represent some regret or some shame and it can make you look weak if that's not your intention. There's a desire to be likable. Often this is seen in women more than men I tend to apologize uh, because you wanna seem likable. There are stereotypes that come uh, along with strong women at work. This is even more true for people of color in the workplace. And often we're taught from a young age that we should try to please everyone. So we find ourselves apologizing for something that might be anything that might be displeasing to someone else, whether it has anything to do with us or not. It could be insecurity. It could be this embedded insecurity. If you put sorry before your word, it negates the power of the word that you say next. And it lets the listener know that you're not completely comfortable communicating. And of course, that you know, to say and to actually mean sorry, there are plenty of times when it's absolutely appropriate to apologize at work. And I think here the key is not to say sorry, but to express why you're sorry. A sincere apology can go with the reason behind it and it's much more powerful. One alternative that I'm trying to use is instead of saying sorry, I'm trying to say thank you. So instead of saying sorry, I'm late, I'm trying to say thank you for waiting for me. If you had an email that there was a mistake in a document, instead of emailing back, sorry about that type roll, why don't you say, thank you for catching that? Or sorry about this technical challenge on Zoom, why don't you say, thank you for your patience? And for my last slide, what do I want, right? Why am I here? Why am I, why am I talking about this in the mistake session? Really, I want everyone to know that it's okay if you don't respond to my email or my text right away, uh, that's fine. And I don't know, I don't need to know why. I don't, you know, I don't need to know what's happening in your life. I know that everyone at home is trying to work and take care of children and pets and your own mental health. And it's, it's okay. It's okay. Unless you've actively delayed something or you've truly made a mistake, can we all agree to stop saying this? I will challenge myself with the following and I encourage you to do the same. Search your inboxes and texts. Look at how often and why do you use these words? You look for sorry, apologies, and just. If you can, watch video recordings of your talks. Tally up the times that you use these words, including filler words like um, just, like. Maybe you can ask a trusted colleague to do the same for you. If you feel comfortable, let a colleague know that they've used them in meetings or talks in a non-blaming way after the event, especially for interns and fellows. If you catch yourself, take it back, mid-sentence. If you catch yourself saying sorry, say, nope, I, I'm taking that sorry back. I didn't actually mean it. You can try using positive alternatives like thank you. And finally, if you use the word sorry, include the reason that you're sorry. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Tony and Kari and Rebecca for organizing it. Thank you to the colleagues who've talked through all of this with me and who have shared the times that I've said these in meetings. I appreciate your honesty. And thank you all for listening. And cheers. Cheers, Ariel. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, 
Okay, I have a few words to say in conclusion. Um, I would like to ask you to join me in acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodian of the land on which Harvard sits where I work, which is the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people, and is a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Today's beverage has been, because it's a little empty now, a gin and tonic, which is my staple favorite and has served me well. Um, and you know, I just wanna say this has been such a wonderful, wonderful event. Thank you all presenters for your bravery and willingness to share and thoughtfulness and everything. Um, just fantastic. So um, mistakes and accidents are inevitable in any endeavor. Pilots have an expression Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. We are all on this path, and if we can help illuminate it for each other, uh, let's do that. Much of my conservation work, and probably yours, has involved retreatment. <clears throat> um, and like all conservators, I've often found my, myself looking at poorly um, uh, done work and artifacts that were damaged by generations of previous restorers and said to myself, what were they thinking? And how could they have done this? Um, the next thing I say to myself, or I've trained myself <clears throat> to say to myself is, what am I as a conservator doing now that people in 20 or 30 years will say, what was he thinking? In other words, what am I blind to now? What are my current, you know, uh, blindnesses in considering my own work? When I've asked my question um, of this question of myself in the past, I've typically been thinking about materials and techniques and treatment uh, methodologies, and also um, how at times the profession writ large has been carried along with such ill-considered um, enthusiasms at, uh, as using poorly studied, damaging and often reversible materials and techniques, the wholesale de-restoration of ancient marble sculpture, for example, the harsh removal from panel paintings of every trace of non-original restorations, the routine relax, uh, relining, uh, wax relining of paintings, etc. Uh, but now I think we must begin the work of considering different kinds of mistakes in our profession, systemic, institutional, exclusionary, that we have also been sadly blind to or have simply turned away from, the mistakes in our society that have excluded many people of color from our profession. As reported in the New York Times and elsewhere, the urgency of the COVID-19 pandemic has forced doctors and researchers in all countries to acknowledge and share their treatment methods, errors, and successes in unprecedentedly fast and often uh, uncomfortable ways. The tragic killings of black citizens this year and earlier and the protests going on now have caused us to make a similar and difficult but equally urgent confrontation of the embedded systemic racism in our own country and in many others. Our profession, our places of employment, museums, other institutions are also engaging in this work of self-examination and reappraisal. We see this in the brave, frank, and often uncomfortable conversations in our AIC community fora, um, in our workplaces, with colleagues, and in the media. It is timely and right that our framing of mistakes for this event has been enlarged to include historic and current mistakes in conservation, um, racial equity and in exclusion, harassment, and gender issues. 
I'm heartened that some of the strongest voices I read in AIC fora publications and have heard in talks come from young emerging conservators, including and especially those of color. Their bravery is an example for us all and gives me hope for our future. Thanks for listening and let's get to work. Thanks for those closing remarks, Tony. We do have about 10 minutes or so still for some questions and discussion. Um, I understand we have, uh, I think Sarah Rydell wants to share a mistake. And after that, let's take, um, take some questions and discussion. Sarah, could you unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, this has been a really great session. Thank you all. Um, I feel a little self-conscious that this is um, a little humorful um, after some really weighty and really important conversations. Um, but I was really thinking about um, what it was like to be an intern and how pressure filled that is for everybody. And one of the mistakes I made was being a little bit too much in my head. I was working in a very busy lab um, with uh, fantastic people who were very focused on their work. And I the point of my tweezers slipped and I made a small tear in a manuscript. Um, and I said, whoops, just happy as the day is and, and um, kept my head down. And I heard suddenly a complete lack of noise. Everyone in the room held their breath and they all turned to me. Some of them are on this call today and they may, they may remember this. And I just looked up and I saw them and I said, oh, it's okay, I can fix it just like that. Um, so I think for me, I remember this because I do know how to fix things. And if I don't, I figure it out. Um, and also these mistakes are really human and they happen. And I just thought I'd share that with everybody and um, I feel a little self-conscious about it. But honestly, I remember it because it reminds me I'm human in these really pressure-filled professions. So thanks. Thank you for sharing, Sarah. And others, if anyone else would like to share a similar kind of story, please go ahead and say that in the chat box. Um, let us know you want to speak. If you have any questions or comments, please, um, again, please uh, mention that in the chat box and I'll call on you. Um, we can take a few questions that uh, were asked previously that um, weren't able to be addressed. Uh, there's a question that came in for Suzanne. A graduate student asked, did um, the male um, uh, creep, <laughs> the person who was um, who uh, was sort of perpetrating these un this unfortunate behavior, did he end up getting the grant that you um, that you had to review? I don't think so. So I think he was taken off the grant. Yeah, and I, I will say that um, my male colleagues. I don't know, they didn't respond exactly the way that I thought they would. So they really um, were shocked. They were all shocked. They all took it really seriously. But I will say that a number of them kind of tried to explain this man's behavior in some interesting ways. Like, you know, they were sort of like, oh, he was interested in you and he was just really shy. And that's how he was showing it. And I was like, hmm, he was interested in all four of us? Like, really? Like, that was the thing? Like, I see Nella shaking her head. Yeah. So, you know, there, there was some, um, there was some interesting kind of like trying to, I don't know, be okay with it. But, um, but, you know, they, they did all take it really seriously. And, uh, yeah, I, and I guess I didn't, I didn't totally expect that. So that was good. I am two martinis in right now. So, I might be happier than I would normally be, but uh, yeah, but no, guy didn't get the grant and um, yeah, so that's the, that's the end of that story, I guess. Thank you again for sharing that. I think it's so, so important to hear um, and, and really thank you for speaking up about what happened. Um, I know uh, there's a question for Nyla from Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, if you'd like to unmute yourself. So Nyla, I know you're a graduate student, so you're immersed in training right now and thinking very critically about what you're doing. I'm wondering, we're all given these guidelines and um, 
rules of how we should handle objects and how we should be careful around objects to avoid things like what happened with Lauren. But perhaps there, do you think there's another component of training that is integral and important for us to consider in these times for avoiding the kinds of mistakes that you discussed today? Should it be something that's part of graduate training? Should it be something that's part of continuing education? Do you have any ideas as you've, have you, as you've thought about these two examples that you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, I have so many ideas that I've been expressing with my program. Um, so I can just say that lots of things are underway without getting into too many details. But one thing I want to say that you might have seen me talk about in the um, AIC forum is the objectivity and subjectivity in conservation. And I think we really started to like, think we're being objective and like, think we can leave our emotions at the door and like, think that all of that is fine, but that's not true. And I just really want us to like, be able to acknowledge that we're human and we're people and we have our own biases and that's okay. And we don't have to be robots. All right. But like, I think in being really transparent with that and including that in, um, you know, reporting and documenting that might even, you know, make future generations curse us less. They might say, oh, hey, look, at least I see where they were coming from. I get why they did this now. So that's, that's sort of my, um, my hope for the future in, in conservation. And uh, one other thing I wanted to say in regards to Ariel's presentation is that I recently um, came across, I think, a post on Instagram or something that was talking about how lean in feminism is out and how women like shouldn't try to be more like men in a sense. And so I want to challenge men to apologize more. Um, I think women apologize too much. And I think we can definitely fix that and be more transparent about that. But at the same time, I want to challenge men to like lower their, you know, offensive standards and apologize more. Thank you. Nyla, I, I secretly, every time I'm somewhere and I get bumped into, if it's a man and I hold it and I don't say sorry, and the man apologize, in my head I go, shh. <laughs> but you're, you're so right. Thank you for saying that. Awesome. Um, we have a few questions, um, sort of more practical ones for Fiona. Um, Fiona, do you think they would have paid your full fee had you included in a, a contingency fee? And um, were you working alone or with the team for remedi remediation? And this person commented, thank you for your honesty. I found it very useful. Um, okay. So I think I've unmuted myself. Um, the answer to the first question was that um, uh, I don't know. Um, if I, I don't know if they would have allowed a contingency as part of their, um, their process. If, uh, uh, it probably, um, I probably could have argued for one based on the urgency of the situation and the fact that um, I wasn't able to, um, to assess the extent of the problem um, before putting in my proposal. Um, I live in a different city. And uh, so I think um, there's, I, I don't know, probably 50-50 um, chance that I would have got, that, that they would have paid the contingency. Um, and then I was working by myself uh, for the most part. The, the two um, museum interns who had uh, initially f discovered the problem um, were available to me for a few hours here and there. Uh, but to be honest, um, I, I could actually get through it faster on my own because um, I, of my teaching habit. I, <laughs> when I was working with them, I kept stopping and explaining things to them. Um, and, uh, so, and, and the, the spaces were so tight that um, uh, it, was, uh, it would have been, it, 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 slowed, it slowed everything down to work with other people. So I didn't do the remediation. I just did the assessment. Um, and then they went out to tender with base, with base using my, the information I provided to them um, to get um, uh, a company or an individual to, um, to tackle the remediation. And um, I'm not sure where that's at now uh, due to COVID. But it, Great, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a, at least a couple of years worth of work for a, a, a you know, four or five people. It's, we're talking about 10,000 artifacts. Wow. 
Well, thank you for clarifying. <laughs> um, I know there is a, a comment or a question um, directed at Ariel about the links, um, some of the links that you uh, discuss. Yeah, I, I pulled this out for time, but I'm gonna share my screen again with you all. Here are a couple of uh, uh, links of things that I was watching as I was prepping for this. So you can take a screenshot or take a photo of this. I'll also share my PowerPoint with the organizers so they can get it out to you. But these are two YouTube videos that I really highly recommend. The one on the left is actually a Pantene commercial called Sorry Not Sorry. It won a lot of awards. It sparked a lot of conversation. It's only a minute long. Please go watch it. Please, please, please go watch it. The other one on the right is a TEDx talk called How Apologies Kill Our Confidence. Uh, by Dr. Maya Jovanich, who's a sociologist. And then here are a few of the articles that I was reading that had some really great recommendations. I cited them under each slide, but if you wanna go, there are many, many more. You can take a screenshot of this as well or Google the articles. Great, thank you so much, Ariel. Um, we, I think, have unfortunately reached our time limit, I believe, um, but I want to say thank you again. Huge thanks to all of our presenters. Thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to Sarah for stepping up to speak about your mistake. Thank you to everyone for your great comments and questions and engagement. Um, you know, we're so glad you attended. If you have uh, thoughts, of how we can um, improve this event in future years. We hope to hold this again. Uh, if you have thoughts of uh, resources or um, other types of programming we could do surrounding this topic, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. It's, we've sort of kicked around ideas for this, um, but would really love your thoughts on what will be um, valuable to our field. So with that, I think, and unfortunately we're out of time, but um, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you next year in person. Yes. <laughs>